Kids love predictability. Kids love silliness. Kids love traditions. Most every camp out there has some kind of traditions that have woven their way into your program or facility. It's part of the cool uniqueness that makes your camp a camp. Some traditions are great. Some should be removed. And you don't have to be a hundred year old sleepaway camp to have them. You can argue that a brand new small indoor day camp can have them and that they're even more important than that setting. Today, we're joined by two of the camp industry's favorite millennials, Jack Schott and Laura Kriegel, who before starting their own programs, traveled across the country in search of cool traditions, some of which are now part of my camp. So sit back and take notes because your camp is about to get a lot better without spending a cent. This is the Day Camp Pod. Welcome back, everybody, to the Day Camp Podcast. I'm Andy Pritikin, Director of Liberty Lake in the Philly suburbs of New Jersey. I'm Sam Thompson from Crystal Lake Park District, Crystal Lake, Illinois. I am Tiffany Grant McDuffie from Purposeful Play, both in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Chicago, Illinois. And we are Day Camp Pros, dedicated to the professional development of our colleagues, discussing topics and best practices that can improve our organizations and ourselves. And we are joined today by my friends Jack Schott and Laura Kriegel from Camp Stomping Ground. How are you guys doing? Welcome. We're, we're doing, doing great, Andy, Sam, I, Tiff. Thanks for having us. This is so I, fun. I, I sense from Jack's email back to me when I asked him about this that he felt like, oh, well, you know, not not day camp guy though. You know, like I'm a sleep wake camp guy. And, and and you know, we do an annual show. I want you guys to know about how to bring the sleepaway camp spirit to day camp because we all feel that we are sort of like sleepaway camp fast food. That's what we are, right? Like we're trying to capture what you guys do, right? In our own little setting. And wait, and wait, wait, whoa, 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 Andy. We're trying to capture what y'all do in our little setting. Well, I think that- Don't patronize me. I sorry. know, I, this is true. <laughs> and Laura will, Laura will attest to this. I think that uh, sleepaway camps are sometimes too mired in the tradition that we're gonna talk about today. Ooh, where day camps have a chance and often are more innovative and able to move faster to get to what the kids and parents really want. And then it takes a little bit of time for that to kind of move up the chain to sleepaway camps where we're taking our time, like, oh, no, nah, we're out in the woods, things or whatever. And, uh, and then I'm like, wait a minute, Tiff did what? Let me write that down. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to cut you off, but- no. Uh, Dude, you are right on it. And, and I got to tell you, when, you know, the ACA New York, New Jersey, we do resident camp tours and we do day camp tours, right? There are always day camp people at the resident camp tours. There are never resident camp people at day camp tours, all right? But I think you're 100% right. I think that resident camps can learn a lot from us, from how we get stuff in, you know, as efficiently, <laughs> let's call it, as we do. Um, so yeah, so no, I'm glad, glad to hear that. So, so listen, I want to give you guys a little forum to introduce yourselves. I don't know if you guys want to tag team it or alternate or whatever, but, um, uh, and, and then sort of lead up into how, you know, you got to camp stomping ground and all, all right? So take it away. <laughs> Laura um, has a much nicer microphone, so you might as well yeah, start. All right, I'll, I'll take this one. <laughs> um, my name is Laura, um, Laura Kriegel, and I'm one of the um, founders and now the co-executive director at Camp Stomping Ground. Um, and before, uh, so this is this coming summer will be our seventh summer running camp. Um, obviously, last summer we weren't able to run um, like a full in-person program due to COVID, but uh, we started camp in 2015. And before that, we had a chance to travel across the country um, on, a, on a research trip called Camping Coast to Coast, where we were um, passed along from <clears throat> different camps and organizations and kid-centered spaces uh, like long lost cousins um, and uh, were welcomed into these really magical um, and intentional communities for kids and we collected best practices um, and uh, had, have tried to share that with the rest of the camp community as well. And so in March we acquired a property which was just a wild time to choose to take on a bunch of debt. Uh, and our little nonprofit got to work getting ready for the summer. And we, you know, the, what do people like to say? 2020, the word of the pivot, uh, we pivoted to virtual programming, which was, which was fun. And hopefully we'll be able to get camp going this summer as long as Cuomo gets the stamp of approval. But Andy, I know you're about to, to jump in and, and let, talk about what, uh, what Scott Arizella likes to call uh, no rules camp. Oh yeah, I do, I do want to talk about that. But I think you guys are selling yourself short. You're being super humble. Um, yeah, I want you to talk about when you first decided, because by the way, um, 
these these are young people okay these people listening okay these are not like some grizzled like 50 year old camp pros that we're talking to here right these are people that basically graduated college worked at camp you know when they were younger and, and graduated college and said i want to be a camp professional so there's like we could do a whole podcast just on that uh, about how they sort of muscled their way in because they really were intentional about how they uh, made it happen. And, and one of the ways they made it happen is they just freaking made it happen. So like they literally were just like, okay, we're like gonna put a sign up and we're gonna have a camp. And so when you first started, what did you do? You rented a private school or like, where did you get the space from? Yeah, so we rented uh, Camp Johnsonburg. It's a Presbyterian camp in, in New Jersey, not too far from you, Andy. And uh, we ran camp for one week. And the way it happened is we were driving around the country. We visited a whole bunch of camps. We were taking notes. We, we honestly thought we were going to try and weasel our way into like being directors at the Y or, you know, whatever kind of. We honestly, we were looking for the camp, that, the, the best <laughs> camp to work at and the best camp to be, um, to, to like climb the ranks of, or like to, that, that we would have wanted to be kids. So you went like on a 60 camp audition. Exactly. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we, we visited along the way and worked for some really incredible people. We we visited 200 camps in 48 states over oh, uh, over the course of two years. And Andy, I bet if we'd met you earlier, and you'd wanted to, you could have just hired us, and we wouldn't even be doing this right now. We'd just be working for you. Yeah, but unfortunately, I didn't. I didn't make the cut I, at that time. Liberty Lake wasn't in the top 200. That's what it comes down to. Well, you you also would have met us and gone. I don't know about these folks, but we we met Scott Arizella, and and he didn't have quite a camp to hire us for. So he said, "Hey, well, you guys going to start a camp?" And we said, "No, you need a gazillion dollars." And I know Tiff and Andy, you know this isn't true, but we thought at the time you needed. Uh, a ton of money to start to start camp and we didn't have family with a bunch of wealth or whatever and so we said no no we're not going to do that um and he was like why not you you can just rent a camp like you rent a car and then you convince your friends to come work <laughs> work for you and then the hard part is is finding kids and so we were like i don't know and he was like no i did it uh come come work for me and uh we volunteered for him for a week at his camp in michigan for kids with autism and uh and then Scott, Sylvia Van Meerten, and James Davis helped Laura and I get Stomping Ground going. We ran for one week in 2015. We had 64 kids at uh, a camp during their staff training. So they're doing staff training over here. We're trying to figure out how to run camp over here. We got our best friends together. They're amazing camp counselors, like people from all over the country who have worked at camps who are unbelievable with kids. They're, they're, they really are magic, right? we thought what could go wrong? These people are incredible. They're gonna, it's gonna be great. And we were like, all right, the thing is, we're gonna try not to say no to kids. And we're gonna try and build uh, a kind of a community where uh, kids learn how to make decisions by making them, right? And, uh, <laughs> and we talked a lot about freedom. We talked a lot about freedom. Uh, and so on the first night we were like, well, we wanna treat kids the way they wanna be treated. So we won't have um, bedtimes because who wants to be put to bed? Like, I don't like getting put to bed, right? I like sleeping, but I don't like being put to bed. And so on the first night of camp, we ended this big program, you know, they had thrown some, somebody in the pool or whatever is this wild event. Then they went back to their cabins. They did embers, like, you know, like a little, like get, get to know you thing at the end of the day, check-in circle. And then they could choose one counselor went to the rec center on camp, which is bright fluorescent lights. And uh, you could go hang out there until you wanted to go to bed. And we had like this system in place where people could, were getting transported back and forth. So they were supervised, all this. We'd, we'd thought it through, you know? And uh, half of camp came to the rec center. The other half went to bed, which is wild, right? Kids choosing to go to bed, that's pretty cool. And then uh, half of camp was there. By 11 o'clock, only a third of camp was there. So there's probably 20 kids there. Uh, and we were like, okay, this is kind of working. It's the first night, people are excited. I, I want to point, there was no homesickness that on the first night, right? <laughs> Nobody was homesick because they got to choose to go to bed or go to the party. Um, and then uh, 11 o'clock, there's 20 kids. 12 o'clock, there's 20 kids. One o'clock, there's 12, there's 20 kids. And our staff are trying so hard and they care so much. They, they're like our best friends trying so hard. And you look over and there's like these seven-year-olds whose eyes are just like bloodshot. And their parents knew, everybody's parents knew that this was what's gonna happen. Like we only have the wildest parents choosing to send their kids to camp and they're amazing. And many of those kids still come to camp today. And, uh, and their eyes are like, you know, whatever. And, and our, our friends are like the staff trying, they're playing basketball. They're trying so hard at like one in the morning to like keep these kids entertained. And uh, two o'clock rolls around and finally Laura's like, we're putting these damn kids to bed. 
And uh, so Laura goes out and like says, all right, everybody, like, listen, like, you know, I, I know I trust all of you, but like the staff have to be up in five hours to start running program again. So we're closing this, this down and y'all are going to go to bed. And, um, and everyone except for one kid was like, basically like, thank goodness you're putting me to bed. Like <laughs> it's time for bed. <laughs> and so they all went to bed and, uh, and we didn't do that. We did like kind of like an after party thing. Uh, that was much more structuredly closed uh, much earlier for the rest of that week. But, uh, but I'll tell you what, we learned something big on that night because that was not, we didn't learn it then, but it happened then. Months later, looking back, we were thinking about um, running in camp again. We were talking to a bunch of teenagers. We were running a trip where we visited a bunch of camps with teenagers. And they were like, well, tell us about your camp. And we were so distraught. We were like, camp was terrible. Like the first week of camp, was, we had forgotten to find a place for us to sleep, and we had slept on a bunch of tennis balls. It was ter- It really was just like so bad. And um, they were like, "No, no, tell us more." And they were like, "It sounds great. It sounds great." We we're like, "No, it doesn't." But looking back, the thing we learned from that moment, I think, is like we made a huge mistake that we should have had bedtimes. Duh! Everyone told us we should have had bedtimes, by the way, but we weren't going to listen to anyone. And uh, and then we told the kids we made a mistake, and ex- they basically all were like y'all are so cool for saying that you made a mistake. Like, yeah, we'll go to bed. We don't care. Like it's too late anyway. Um, and that I think gave us the freedom and the confidence to be willing to make mistakes and then admit them to kids, which then coming back to this, let us have the freedom or the confidence to try and bring some traditions to camp, even if they weren't, even if they didn't work. So we could try something. And if it didn't work, we could make a new plan. We could try something new. Um, it's and, a great uh, lesson. It's a great lesson. And I'm, I'm sure all your staff were like, thank God, this is a one week camp. But um, <laughs> we have bedtimes now and lots of and lots of rules just just for the record. Yeah, I know you do. Um, so so I met Jack and Laura when they went they went on like a tour after their tour, you know, to all the conferences and presented. I saw them do it at National and at Tri-State. So I saw you do it twice each part one and part two and and, because it's so overwhelming the amount of stuff and and the stuff is culled together on your camp coast to coast website right Mm -hmm. right so people could check that out we got to make sure that gets in the show notes um all right so what is it about traditions since you guys got to see so many right what is it about traditions that kids just why do they love traditions you know and they could be the dopiest little things i'm sure even year one in your rented you know, Johnsonburg thing, you had, you know, you, by the end of the week, there were traditions. Like, what do you think it is? I, I think, I think that um, kids latch on to something that's familiar and repetitive, and it creates that sense of belonging. So even if it's something that happens from day to day, all of a sudden, if you're, if you're like in the inner circle, and you know what's going to happen next, you have that sense of like, well, I must, I must belong here because I know what's coming. Um, and so I think traditions do that for kids. They create a sense of belonging. So do you think like, like, yes, that's so common sense, right? Yeah. And, and now, and, and we all understand it when we're kids, but right. it seems like adults hit a certain age mm-hmm. or teenagers, whatever, they get, get to a certain age um, where you just want to sort of break away from everything. You want to be free, right? And this is why like a lot of counselors could be really good counselors, but they think that being a cool counselor means like letting the kids do whatever they want right but it actually means creating structure right but you know laura but you you freaking your columbia university like you know that like structure is important like you said it yourself right like it's super important right the kids need to know where the walls are absolutely right and 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 what i'm getting at is that at day camp there's a lot of younger kids and we can get silly at day camp. I mean, I'm not saying you can't get silly, sleepaway camp too, but when you have younger kids, you even have more of a license mm-hmm. to get silly. And I think that there's a lot of, of camp professionals out there that are hesitant to let their hair down a bit mm-hmm. to get silly and create and do the princess pat and stuff like that because they think it's hokey or whatever, you mm-hmm. know? But actually like kids love it and they do latch onto it. And you said, you know, that thing about it actually creates, creates community. It's like a it's like a cheap psychological trick yes. for creating community, right? The other thing is, if the kids have you have a event and the kids love it and they have really good feelings about it, they want to recreate it the next year. You know, they want to. It was so cool last year when we did this. Can we do that again? And you know, you want change also, but a few traditions aren't bad because they look forward to getting to recreate those feelings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
That's a great point too, Sam. Yeah. So I, I've got an idea. The way we, we can handle this because we all got ideas. We all got traditions, right? So I, I, we're going to go, we're going to go like bounce around each of us and pull out one from our, our bag of stuff. Okay. And we'll let our guests go first. All right. So theoretically they'll go more times. Okay. Um, <laughs> so ladies first, Laura, you can go first. All right. Let, let's just, let's start talking about some of these cool things we're talking about. So we're talking about things that we specifically do with campers at camp. That create well, you know, Sam and I were, were talking during the day, we were messaging each other. Uh, it could be staff traditions too, okay. because I think that that's a whole separate thing, but it's just as important. That's great. All right. Well, I'll start, I'll start with how we start off each day at, at stomping ground. Um, and, and we can go into other camps too. But yeah. And, and before you say that, let's, yeah. I just want to make a point to my day camp people out there who have never been to a sleepaway camp. Like this is like super important part of the day at a sleepaway camp is gathering, whether it's the flag or whatever you're gathering around, like that is like obligatory sleepaway camp 101, but yet a lot of day camps don't know about it or don't do it. And that's like, it's a, it's a real simple way to get it going. Yeah, that's, that's fascinating, Andy, because I, I think, you know, we, we all, everybody kind of trickles up into the dining hall if they're on their own um, with their, with either their village or their cabin group and they it kind of everybody's kind of still sleeping all that kind of stuff and nobody really feels like they're a part of camp yet until we get down to the picnic table and everybody kind of arrives at different times and so i think this 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 particular tradition was born out of necessity jack is standing on the picnic table waiting for you know the one village that's farthest away with the senior boys to make their way over to the picnic table and they're taking their sweet time and so jack's standing up there going what what are we going to do what are we going to do as we like you know, now there's like, you know, 50% of the camp, 75% of the camp. So um, the tradition that was born out of that is um, called Tell Me Something Good. And we sing a song called Tell Me Something Good. And um, kids wait, yell Wait, 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 Laura, how does it go? <laughs> you were going to make me do that. It goes, tell me something good. Mm -hmm. And all the, and the kids like, raise their hands or staff raise their hands and just say something that they're like essentially grateful for in that moment. Um, it could be something really small or it could be something rather profound. And um, they can't wait to share. Um, and, and then we um, react to it and celebrate that moment with them and then move on and somebody else gets to share their thing. And so um, it's it, it can be, you don't have to be there the whole time to know what's happening because it's very repetitive. So we might do, I don't know, um, between 15 and 30 tell me something good while we're waiting for all of camp to show up um and and the kids know you know they all ever the whole camp choruses along tell me something good um until one kid speaks and says what what is good for them nice very cool yeah all right passing the torch uh so um a tradition that's much less um uh kind of like rooted in gratitude um, is uh, the way that the bad guys are always defeated at the end of any of our big events. So uh, I think that you can do big events. I think you can do big events with bad guys, sleepaway camp, uh, day camp, anything, right? If you're running capture the flag, just have a bad guy that's wandering around that can tag anyone. And if they tag somebody, they have to do whatever, it doesn't matter. And then at the end, somebody can win. If you're a camp that has winning, we do. Um, and then everyone gets together and defeats the bad guy, right? So then somebody maybe won the game, but then you also get to defeat the bad guy. Um, the way bad guys get defeated at Stomping Ground always is some kind of theatrics happen, and then the bad guy gets thrown in the lake. Um, so you can throw him in the pool. Bad guy, but it, it always isn't a guy also. It's like a character. Right. It's not always a bad guy. It tends to be me um, because <laughs> I, I am a, a Play easier, great bad guy. I, I'm an easier bad guy than Laura, and everybody knows me. Um, and so, uh, but we throw them in the lake and kids chant, throw them in the lake, throw them in the lake. And uh, you get, you know, I get thrown in the lake or whoever the bad guy is, uh, is thrown in the lake. Um, but kids get so excited about that, but it could be dump a bucket of water or any of thing like that as a, and I like it as an end. Kids know it's coming. It, it's easy to be a part of. I think that we talk a lot about the hidden curriculum at camp or what is the unspoken rules because traditions are really great and they are exclusionary because if there's not an easy way to get onto a tradition, then it feels like you're not a part of it. You're an outsider at camp. 
So it, you know, to have tradition creates insiders, but to have insiders, it automatically means there's outsiders. So what can we do? And that disproportionately impacts people that wouldn't normally be at camp or are new to camp or whatever. So, so, like it, uh, so what can we do to make it easy? So throw them in the lake is an easy chant to get along with. I get thrown in the lake and it kind of symbolizes the end. I come out of the lake, not in character, but as me uh, to go on to the kind of the next, the next thing. So um, throw them in the lake. All right, so just so you know, at a day camp chat, the kids go home and tell their parents that night what happened, all right? Just, just so you know. So, you know, when we say like we tried to drown Jack, you know, like <laughs> then they call and say, hey, uh, this is Mrs. Wiedemeyer calling. Um, my kid says that there was 50 kids trying to drown Jack today. But anyway, we can modify it for day camp. It's yeah. cool, it's cool. That's great. Um, speaking of 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 um, of <laughs> traditions that could get that could go the wrong way, because sometimes people that are at camps for a long time, they inherit traditions that are actually not so cool, right? And I know some day camps that have had to go through with that. To th that people had to stand up and say, "Hey, look, like it's it's the year two thousand and whatever. Like we can't do this tradition anymore, right? Because it's just wrong, right? We're trying to teach these kids all these great morals and ethics, and we're doing this like completely unethical thing right here, right? Or against our, our morality, right? Uh, so uh, just a quick story. I visited a sleepaway camp once, one of the most prolific, famous, like oh my god, it's the greatest sleepaway camp places. Um, just like your tour of two hundred, right? And I woke up after this amazing evening of amazing traditions and stuff. I woke up with this great feeling and I'm in their dining hall and, and, and we all eating breakfast and this kid bumps into somebody and drops his stuff and like, and like broken glass, like huge noise. Right. And the entire cafeteria, like dining hall, right. Of like 300, 400 people in unison start singing. Jack is a klutz, a big fat klutz. And another three verses after that, right? And I am like dying a slow death, like with the <laughs> owners of the camp. And I'm looking at them and my and the directors who are my friends. And I'm like, how do you allow this to happen? And they look at me and they're like, oh yeah, you know, like this has been, go this is way before we got here. And like, excuse, 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 excuse. And I'm like, this needs to end today. Like, this is just horrible. And they kept it going for the rest of the summer, but they did stop it after that summer. But so, so I just throwing it out there that traditions wow. can go awry. <laughs> we used to have a throw them in the lake while well, they throw me in the lake every, <laughs> at the end of the summer, but um, we're a public beach. So there were people sunbathing from the public that were getting splashed. And so that, you know, cut it off right there. So that and losing several cell phones in the lake because <laughs> I never knew when it was coming. And by the way, Motorola, Motorola walkie talkies don't do very well in the lake mm -hmm. either, I have to say. That's why we switched to the $12 uh, Chinese ones. But Sam, why don't you, why don't you go to, give us a tradition? Okay, um, I guess our newest tradition, uh, the teen campers made up, um, are, the facility that they're out of is at the beach, but the big building is a wedding venue on the weekends. And when they figured that out, they decided to hold a mock wedding. So they spent all week long making flowers, making invitations, making, um, you know, the schedule, all that, and had, uh, they elected one of the camp counselors to marry the other, and uh, set up all the chairs, and the very first year, it was, you know, pretty basic, just the ceremony, but they had so much fun doing it, and they all dressed up, everyone came on their Sunday best, and, you know, like it was a wedding, so the next year, then all of a sudden, now we have a reception after the wedding, now we have a videographer, now we have a DJ and dancing. So the whole thing just became huge. And every year they're like, when are we gonna do this? They get to decide when in the summer they're gonna do it. And uh, they elect who's what thing and who's flower girls, who's attendants and all that kind of stuff. So. Very nice, so fun. very nice. Yeah. Tiff, you got one? Yeah, so my traditions are not campy, as everybody knows. I'm like sports. I know, camp. but that's why we we want to hear the urban <laughs> so camp. What's do, happening? We do a camp rap every year. I mean, my kids are definitely live between rap and reality. So like we recreate, we'll use one of the beats from a common rap song. And so then we have a competition every year and people have to like, so we use it like writing, like, you know, literacy as well. People have to submit their lyrics and they have to be according to like our core values. So they have to include some of the words for our core values. 
in the rap and every year the, the cool thing about it is that the kids are getting this experience it's literacy it's music we sing it across the whole city so you'll and then we use it in all of our marketing stuff so it literally becomes like our commercial for for camp for that year and then they have like battles between you know like was this year better than last year what have you I almost wanted to sing one of them when Laura started singing but I'm scared <laughs> <laughs> just, just you know, Tiffany, just give everybody your TikTok handle. All right. <laughs> exactly. No, it's been so. Fun. One year though, they did it, and I'm not gonna sing it because I'm just I'm not that brave right now. But it's like just the acronym play, and so it's like P is for play because we love can't play. L is for laugh because we laugh all day. A is for athletics because we do them every day. Why is for you? You need to come to camp play. And then all the kids are screaming, hey, hey. So it was like a really, really cool one because then it just be like, we're like, what kid doesn't want to come? You get to make your own song. Um, but to back up before my tradition, I wanted to say for the people who are like visually watching, it, or, if, or if you're not visually watching, maybe you should go check it out because the only person not laughing when Jack was telling his story was Laura. <laughs> <laughs> No, no bedtime. Cringing. Cringing. Uh, Andy, Sam, and I were all cracking up, and Laura was looking like, "Yep, nope, wasn't a good idea." <laughs> so, um, I think that's to Andy's point of how some traditions, um, you know, need to go. Um, it's valid, but I also love what Jack said about, you know, we try and we quit and we start and we stop, and I think that that's one of the embedded or hidden lessons in camp because we're teaching kids over and over again, you know life is all about trying and quitting and revamping and starting and refreshing and going back and doing it again. And um, I love Jack's shirt because literally to the very first, <laughs> it says radical empathy. I, the reason why empathy is one of the core values that can't play is because of Jack. Like literally, I didn't even, I didn't even contemplate, we were a sports camp in an urban setting. And though sport has a lot of character building um, things within it, I never was like putting two and two together as like the the deep characteristics of of the lessons that we were teaching. It was kind of just innate. And I had an experience with Jack when we were first starting bootstrapping this thing. And he's like, you know, like what are your what are your ideals and what are you teaching? And I'm like, basketball. And he's like, no, there's more. Dig. And he was just like making me dig deep. And so um, I'm just very grateful for this, this reconnection here. And so tons of lessons I've taken from the, um, the uh, overnight camp or the sleepaway camp and, and brought into mine. So when he says he's watching what I'm doing, it's crazy because I feel like I learned so much from, from our time together. Tiff, that's incredible. Thank you. And I don't remember doing that. Probably I didn't do that. But uh, <laughs> wait, but Tiff, I have a question because you've started camp and Andy started camp. Sam, I don't think you started camp. But uh, either way, what what was it like or how did you think about like starting the traditions at camp from scratch? Like there's nothing there. You got a blank slate. Yeah, we need traditions or how, how did you think about that? Right. Well, I was actually I was given a tour today to, a, to an interview uh, to somebody who was who'd been a camp professional for a while. And I, and I told her, I said, you know, my camp and I'm sure you would say the same about stomping grounds. It's a greatest hits. Right. Of of traditions and best practices and stuff that I we, that we have gathered from our camp careers. Right. Whether it's visiting camps face to face, listening to podcasts. Right. Or um, or or going to conferences and, and gathering stuff like that. You know, I mean, this is one of the main reasons we do this day camp podcast is to spread is to spread the word and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I piggyback off of that. I think Pinterest, you know, campsites. <laughs> I remember thinking I remember thinking ACA was not for day camps. I, I didn't apply for accreditation until just last year because I was like, oh, that's not, that's that thing is not for day camps. That's for overnight camps. I could never. And so um, definitely conferences, the women in camp conference that ACA Illinois put on was like very eye opening. Even before that, every time I've gone to anything ACA, I'm like, oh, wait, I can revamp and tweak that. And there was someone else I heard speaking. Um, I don't know who it was, but they're just like, 
creating a culture of this is what happens here, right? And so like, that's the power of traditions because no matter what, especially in the urban setting, no matter what our kids experienced or no matter what the news was reporting about our neighborhoods or no matter what they might encounter at school or even at home in their neighborhoods, like when they entered the doors of purposeful play, it's like, this is what happens here. And it's, it's funny that you don't remember. I can send you some emails back where you were like helping me create the brand story. And literally I was like, oh, it is more than just sports. So. So yeah, just just digging in the crates and seeing what other people's best practices are. And then we just always put an urban swag on it. Like, okay, and we can make it cool. The other thing when Andy was talking about um, doing stuff wonky, like singing Princess Pat, like I have six foot six basketball players that are reigning <laughs> as the you know center or whatever position they play at their school. So when I get them trying to sing these camp songs, they're looking at me like, first they're looking like, you do know that I'm black, right? And then I'm looking at them like, I, me too, I am too, but this is going to be fun. And when they see how it's so entertaining to the kids and how, you know, like captivating it is and how, you know, just kind of like widening the kids lens as to what they think is um, acceptable and fun and true and just like changing their perspective, like Andy's background, the lake and getting kids fishing and when all they were ever used to was basketball has just been like a phenomenal experience. So this ability to turn the camp experience into a tradition that happens in the middle of a big city has just been everything. Yeah, that's awesome. This is why this is why we do it. And Jack, mm -hmm. I, I inherited a bad situation <laughs> and kind of wiped it out and started over. Um, but underneath an agency that had total control too. So trying to balance the two. Yeah. And, and let's be honest, a good portion of the people listening are in your boat, Sam, you know, and, and, and have to balance that, you know, whether it's with boards of directors or agencies or whatever it is. Which you know? really, Sam, makes your job harder than ours, than Andy's and I, because we, we can kind of just be injects, like we can just kind of like try it on, take it off, blah, blah, blah. But you have to do it within the constraints of the system. So it really makes you a pioneer, you know, and, and forging your own way within something that that's, needs revamping. Right. So b before I talk about a tradition that I got from these guys, I just want to, I want to tell Jack and Laura about a product. Okay. Because we're, we're pushing products here too. All right. So, so it, one of our, our sponsors is commercial recreation specialist CRS, right? You see them at all the conferences with the big wibbits and all these kind of things. Well, they got a new product that they're, they're putting out there called plate tech, right? Which you can spray onto stuff or fog or whatever onto, onto playgrounds, onto tables, onto whatever. And you got to clean it first, right? Disinfect it first and then spray this stuff on it. And it will disinfect for two months. Okay. Literally two months, like in this germy age that we're they're living in, right? You could buy the big five gallon jug of it and water it down or whatever and use it. Playtech, P-L-A-Y-T-E-C. It's made with, get ready. Concrobium. I know it sounds like something from an Avengers movie, but it that's <laughs> and it's derived by from time, T-H-Y-M-E. So it's natural. So you don't even need PPE or anything to put it on. All right. Sounds too good to be true. I know. All right. But it's going to be out there and it's going to, it's a really cool product. Look for it. All right. Playtech. Commercial recreation specialists. Okay. To find purveyors of the best recreation solutions, check out their website, crs4rec.com. CRS is serious for fun. All right. So, oh, and by the way, since we're plugging things, um, Tiff mentioned radical empathy. Okay. And these guys have all, since day one, they've been about radical empathy, even that when they were, even they were, when they were running camp anarchy. And, um, so, um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, I have, I have coffee the other day with my awesome radical empathy mug that you guys gave me. It, it's, it's great mug, but, um, Laura and their, their program director, a lady, Clee, right? She's awesome. They started a podcast called Inspiring Radical. Now, now there's a Radical Empathy podcast, which I endorse also. It's great. Okay, but they're doing one called Inspiring Radical Empathy, which sort of, I don't know, clarifies it a little bit. Can you just give us the, the 30 second elevator pitch on this, Laura? Because it's great. Yeah, podcast. yeah, I'd love to. Thanks, Andy. Um, so the first season we did, it's five episodes long, all about restorative justice and restorative practices. So uh, one of the ways, one of the, um, uh, core values at Stomping Ground is uh, restorative justice and trying to figure out um, how to bring people together, especially in conflict, 
um, to heal harm, mitigate future harm, and build community. And so our, our five season podcast digs into the uh, history of restorative justice, um, how the racial justice movement and the restorative justice movement are connected, um, uh, as well as the school, like schools and how um, schools and other communities that are built for kids are using restorative justice and, and restorative practices and then zooms out and looks at like the larger society and how um, restorative justice has the potential to have a huge impact on our world. Um, so that was the first season. Um, uh, it was really fun. We learned a lot. It was the first podcast Stomping Ground has produced. Um, the second season we're working on now, we're just getting all of our ducks in a row. It's going to be about um, decision making. So Stomping Ground's whole mission uh, is to inspire the next generation of radically empathetic decision makers. So we're going to take the, the second uh, season of our podcast and talk about um, what it means to make decisions, what are what kind of an impact those decisions have on ourselves, on others, and, and on the larger community. That's great. And, and, you know, you guys inspire me by by talking about this stuff and, and, and the way that watching how you guys apply it to your camp, you guys should, all, you should follow Camp Stopping Ground on all the social media platforms because these are social media mavens here. And they put out lots of great stuff. They put out lots of great virtual stuff during the uh, COVID times and all. Um, they're the only sleepaway camp I know that's got Black Lives Matter painted onto the side of a bunk. All right. I mean, these guys, they, they, they talk to talk and they walk to walk. So I appreciate it. So thanks for all you do with the camp industry and, and helping inspire people. All right. So back to the more mundane stuff. So tradition. So I, I, I start this camp. I got this blank slate, right? I go to this session where, where Jack and Laura vomit like 500 traditions to me in a, in a 90 minute period. And, um, and the easiest one was that they had visited a camp that had a bridge where all the kids and counselors had to walk backwards over the bridge and they called it the backwards bridge. And I was like, damn, I got a bridge. We're gonna make it the backwards bridge. I'm gonna make two signs that cost 20, you know, $20 for two sides and I'm gonna put them up there. And now I got a backwards bridge and now everybody goes backwards and that's it. But that's just an example how like, like my camp literally, I could point around at my camp and say, I got that from Camp Ramakoy and I got that from Camp Pierce and I got that from like, that's, you just got to cull all this stuff and use it when you're starting with a blank slate. Like Tiff is starting at a brand new place in Chicago, right? And she's going to walk in and she's going to be like, okay, hmm, what can we bring from the last place? And, you know, maybe we can walk backwards through this hallway. I was literally about to say, <laughs> there's a the bridge by the park. We're walking backwards over the bridge. Hell yeah. It's yeah. the littlest things that just light kids up, right? And we all do this for like that that spark in their eyes to see them be like, oh, okay, this is fun. So no, mm -hmm. backwards bridge walking is a thing. So all right, well, we're, we're going to do like a snake draft now. So I'm going to go <laughs> twice. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so because you were talking about starting the day, Laura, right? So, you know, a lot of camps start their day with music. Right. And it's easy. Music is a great traditional kind of thing. Right. Needless to say, um, we found this great Lisa Loeb song. Um, Lisa Loeb did a Camp Lisa album, help raise money for Scope and, and all these other organizations. And um, there's a wake up song on there. It goes, everybody wake up, wake up. Right. Kind of thing. And for a day camp, you know, where kids are coming in on the bus and blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, it works great. It gets everybody psyched up. Everybody sings along. Counselors jump around and like act it out and stuff on the stage. So that that's a that's a simple no brainer. All right. Passing it back to you, Laura. Cool. Um, I like that, um, Andy. And I'm I'm jealous of the um, musical background that you have and how you're able to kind of weave music into camp. Jack and I are not musical, neg negatively musical. So you hire somebody. So, yeah. Uh, we're, we're always searching for how to bring more music into our program. Well, by the way, great, great um, interview question or, or question on your application. Do you sing? What instrument do you play? Like those, like get that, get hardcore information on that. That's great. That's a great tip. Um, my, my tradition that I think um, any camp couldn't do, and I'm sure a lot of camps already do, um, but maybe we don't think of it as a tradition, is uh, wandering characters. Um, so we have a costume room at camp and it's got dozens and dozens, hundreds probably of uh, donated costumes from recitals um, that kids have been at or staff have been at over the years, or my mom loves to go shopping on the um, November 1st of every year. She goes to Target and Walmart and all of the costume places and buys all the, the discount costumes. Um, and so that's another tradition that she's helped us form. But 
So we have this giant classroom room and um, sometimes in those awkward transition periods that all camps have where we're waiting for small groups of kids to join back with the big group, um, we might have a wandering character sitting out in the field. Um, a few years ago, we had a, a staff member named Nina who um, uh, her wandering character, sometimes she would dress up as uh, old man Jenkins uh, and would just go sit out on the field um, and um, be cranky uh, and it was so <laughs> funny because the kids would kind of come up and interact with her and um, uh, it was a memory um, that the kids have from um, from in instead of like waiting for everybody to show up and kind of being bored in that transition moment they found something um, like magical and, and different about gathering back on the field so that's awesome I love that that's great <laughs> I called, I called my friend Jason Smith, who is the executive director at YMCA Camp Kentucky today, because I was trying to figure out traditions that I could share and I was blanking on so many. And he was telling me about, uh, they do what they call star jars for their oldest campers. So on the, at the very end of their oldest campers time at camp, the last time that these kids will be able to come back to camp. So it might be when they're 13, 14, whatever it is, they're going to transition into either staff or they're going to transition into something else. Um, he and the other person who's kind of like the head of camp go to their group at the very end during their wrap up time. So you might call it embers or whatever you call your kind of wrap up for the day. And he, they give them, Nat and Jason, give their kids a star jar and it's a glass jar in the shape of a star. And they only give it to the kids that are aging out of the program. So there might, you know, they might in that group, they might have only three of the 10 kids that can't come back or whatever the case might be. And they give them a, a jar with the ashes from the campfire that they've had, but could be dirt from camp, you know, whatever it is, the, the item doesn't really matter. And they tell them, you know, you know, we have really appreciated you being a part of camp. They tell some, some kind of story, some kind of connection that they have to those kids. And, um, they talk about how, you know, a lot of places are really great at beginnings. We've already talked a lot about how the day starts, but we as a society kind of suck at endings, you know? And so they say like, this isn't the end of your time, you know, being a part of camp. It's just the end of your time as in this program this way and take this with you. And uh, I hope that you, um, you really appreciate it. And uh, they tell a couple of stories and, you know, they celebrate those kids. And what they've done now, which we, you know, if you don't have a facility, you can come up with a different way to do this. But now what they've done is their youngest kids put a handprint on a wall at a special part of camp um, that they call Discoverer's Point. And um, so now they take those kids and they make sure that those oldest kids are doing their last night, um, kind of their, the end of their day um, ceremony at Discoverer's Point when it's the end of camp so that they can look back at what maybe they have to put their hand on this wall. So it kind of completes this, this kind of circle. Um, but you could do it on a piece of plywood that just goes up in the gym for the summer or whatever, it, you know, it wouldn't need to be like a, a special place at camp. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so star jars from Camp Kentucky. It's cool. And when it comes to like uh, kids longevity at camp, that's an easy one that we did, you know, we put in right away and a lot of day camps have done where like we give out five year jackets and 10 year plaques and 15 year slushy cards. Um, that's the thing at Liberty Lake is a tradition of slushies. It's a big thing. Um, but anyway, yeah, that, that kind of stuff to get to remember endings are big. So it, you should really make sure you have some kind of ending traditions for a kid, especially at a day camp like mine, where kids um, come in and out all summer. You know, it's a big deal, you know. All right, Sam, you're up. All right. Um, my longest tradition um, has been going 35 years, but um, I was at a resident camp when I was seven, a 4-H resident camp, and they, at the end of the week, they had us do a night hike, and we ended by a creek and sat in our groups, and then each counselor would let the kids say what they liked about camp, and then they'd light a candle in a, a little bowl and put it in the creek and it would go down the creek. Well, at the end of all of us floating our bowls, then along the cliff, they started lighting, um, there were more counselors, more staff up there lighting lights. And then they sang, uh, lean on me back the first, when it was popular the first time <laughs> in the seventies. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, I wanted to bring that to my camp. So we only had a pond. So it, we have our 
overnight once during the summer. So we tried to do the floating candle ceremony. And um, at first we would light our things and, and push them out. And then we realized that as they burned down, they were gonna catch the lily pads on fire. <laughs> and so we had big super soakers to you know put out the candles once the kids were asleep so that you know, we didn't start a fire. Um, and it transitioned eventually to um, having a flashlight and doing the like underneath your chin as you talk, each count kid gets to talk and then his counselor group moves back and the next group comes up. And um, so that one's stuck around a long time. That's good. That reminds me a little bit. And so does the one Jack said, if you anyone wants to go back into our uh, inventory, we did one a year ago, uh, an episode with Yoni from Eden Village. And he talked about the angel walk where, where the staff put their hands up and made like a bridge over their kids' heads. And the kids would walk through blindfolded and the counselors would whisper nice things about the kids as they walk through and everybody would just be bawling on their last days of camp. Oh, lots of cool stuff. That's cool. I like that one. I'm writing that one down. Oh, yeah. The Angel Walk. Yeah. We, if Look up the Yoni episode. It explains it pretty fully. All right, Tiff, you want to do another one? Yeah, we um, do a thing that anyone really could do. We call it the goal poll. So we, at the beginning of the year, they come in and they kind of, we do like this vision boarding experience um, where the kids are setting a vision for what they want to see, achieve, or what have you at the at, before the summer is out. And of course, they'll always start with like, I want to go on this trip or that trip, remembering their favorite field trip from the year. But we're like, no, like, well, do you want to be a better swimmer? Do you want to have walked this this far? Do you want to take time off of your 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 track time or make more shots or something that they can actually measure? So like smart goals, because we are all about like teaching big ideas to little kids. And so um, there's a poll on the side of the gym that we just like wrap in um, construction paper and they all get to write their goal and then they like dip their hand and um, and paint and like put their fingerprints on the paper so that it's like an identification back to their goal. So all summer long we're saying, okay, how are you gonna get there? What are you doing? So when they wanna quit or wanna give up or aren't being resilient or aren't showing behavior that aligns with that goal, we can take them back to these were your words, you know, this is what you said you wanted to, to do. So the goal poll is- a I love it. So what happens Tiff when they achieve their goal, anything? They achieve their goal, no. <laughs> High five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so no, we, we actually don't. I mean, we kind of just like celebrate. It's like innate, mm -hmm. right? Like, it's kind of like, well, I didn't even think there's sometimes there's too many, like there's too many of them. So sure. I don't really know. That's a challenge, Andy. Thanks for putting me on the spot. Uh, but yeah, I, was just curious. I think like oftentimes when you are um, like at school or you're expected to get good grades or you're expected to um, clean up your room or what have you, I, it's kind of just the process of getting them in the mindset of you, even though you're little, you should set goals and you should take yeah. steps to get there. So more than anything, it's just like this communal celebration. Like I did it, I got there, yeah. you know, like the, especially the kids who were the swimming is one of their things and they start off scared to put their face in the water and then they're like jumping off the diving board. Like I think that internal celebration has historically been enough, but we will step it up this year. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. Aspiration is one of my start points at my camp, but I just keep thinking about what Jack said. It, it hit home with me that we're really good at beginnings and we're not so great at endings. You know what I mean? Um, all right. So one at my camp, um, I've mentioned it before on the pod, I think, is that we have these little fuzzy guys here I'm showing on YouTube. We're little fuzzy dudes. And uh, <clears throat> when kids do things that are are like really nice gestures of friendship and kindness and, and, and our star points and such, um, we award a fuzzy. And we take off the little sticky feet here and we stick it on their, on their shoulders. And we have a little ceremony where they like stand up on the picnic table and the counselor says, let me tell you about Laura, how, you know, today she helped out the new counselor, the new camper in her group, who was a first day at camp. She had no idea where the bathrooms were, where they had to get to lunch. And Laura took it upon herself. She didn't have to do that. She mentored her all day and helped her out. And then she was a great friend that showed great teamwork. And then we, we all, you know, applaud her. And she walks around all day with this fuzzy. And then the kids all day are going up to Laura and saying, hey, Laura, how'd you get that fuzzy? And she says, oh, well, let me tell you. And she sticks her chest out and tells her how proudly how she got it. And it creates this culture of kindness. And it's super easy and super cheap. And this is from the Ben Applebaum uh, day camp world and sleepaway camp world where we all do these little warm and fuzzies. And, uh, and we spend a lot of money on these little wee pole things. I have the more generic ones. There are the more ritzy camps that have the more, uh, you know, decked out bougie ones, but you know, what are you gonna do? Um, and uh, I want to just do another one, which is um, 
traditions, right? You can make shit up, okay? Like you can make things up that aren't like legit, like, right? So like you could talk about like the big giant turtle that lives behind that thing there, right? And like, you could just like start a legend, you know? You don't have to inherit a legend, you can start a legend, right? So at Liberty Lake, there's this big giant turtle, the size of a VW bug, right? And it only sticks its head up every once in a while. And when it does, man, it terrifies the children and all that kind of thing. And you'd be surprised how many kids come running up to me all summer, Andy, I saw Big Pete's head. And I'm like, oh, you did? Where was it, you know? And, but it's just that kind of stuff. Like you, you can create this. It's, again, when you start with a camp with a blank slate, you need to do this, right? Like why not, right? If you, if, why not just create this cheap excitement, you know, for the kids. All right, back to Laura. All right, listen, we're putting a one minute time limit on this now. Okay, we want to get a couple more in. So go ahead, Laura. Okay, well, I, I just wanted to make one, one quick comment. Yeah. Um, the, the, the values-based traditions, like I, Tiffany, you talked about it. Um, I know, um, uh, multiple multiple ones of us have mentioned that like these these traditions come back to the values that like we hold as a camp um so like the goal pole or the music the songs and things like that the one i'm going to share has really uh it's it's kind of a stretch to get back to our values um but but uh i'm i I am encouraging camps to do um, some a typical activity that you normally do, but put extreme in front of it. So one of the things that we've done at camp is um, extreme bird watching or extreme cloud watching where like, actually the, we stole this one from Biff who worked at YMCA Camp Flaming Arrow. He would duct tape pillows around children and the counselors would go and lay out in the field with, with pillows duct taped to them to do extreme cloud watching. So you can make literally anything extreme. You just gotta have the right um, oomph and the right, uh, the right counselor leading the activity. I'm sorry, Laura, that sounds like more is possible, which is something that, that which is we- Which part of our values, yeah, yes. Yeah, we really believe in. That's, that's right, back to, uh, right back to our values. Um, Phenomenal. That, love, that was worth the whole podcast right there. I, I, I love the extre that extreme awesome. anything. Ex yeah. Extreme basketball. We just set up a, a sound system and uh, have announcers <laughs> while we play basketball. It's the same thing. It's just basketball, but there's one person that's funny that makes a joke. <laughs> our, and our staff love it because it often means that it's easier for them. Extreme basketball is easier for the person announcing. They just stand there and announce. Like they don't have to do anything. Um, so the, the, the best staff have learned this trick. It's how to be lazy, but have a better time. Ex extreme bird watching. I think um, what a staff member just put like really intense eye makeup and like face paint on, and then they look <laughs> like heavy metal and like watch the birds. Like it was like, very simple activities, but- They could also get dressed up as a bird for extreme bird watching. Very That's nice. what I'm thinking. Uh, so I want to go to staff. <laughs> I want to go uh, staff traditions. And our, uh, Tiff mentioned that sometimes it's hard to get staff on board. And some of our traditions can sound like a bunch of hippies in the woods are, are, you know, we talk about radical empathy. We, we can, we can come off as a little bit like uh, hippies in the woods sometimes. And that's hard for our staff who maybe uh, aren't such big hippies, you know, like, like urban staff coming to camp or whatever. And so uh, I was clowning with somebody one time about, about Wendy's and we were just like talking about how we love Wendy's. And then it got to the end of the week and I was supposed to lead the like closing staff meeting at the end of the week. And I was like, oh, yeah, we're going to do a four for four. And everyone was like, we're getting Wendy's. Um, but we, the four for four is basically now we do at the end of every week uh, with, our, with our staff team. And we just go over as fast as possible four of these four things. Staff get to, get to say them out loud. So four things that they're grateful for from the week, four funny things that happened that week, four aha moments that they had that week, and four things that they want to do better next week and so not everyone gets to talk only 16 there's only 16 slots um but it's fast and it's uh it it was a joke about wendy's which i then a lot of people go get baconators so um yeah, that's how we roll <laughs> it works <laughs> all right sam um i'll switch the staff to um a couple probably four years ago i was trying to think of you know, the, the staff really always need more shirts, no matter what you do. And I had seen um, a shirt that said, my boss thinks I'm kind of a big deal. And um, so I put that on the back of pink shirts because that was the only color not taken. And they had to do something extra or something, you know, good to be awarded the shirt. 
And um, of course I bought enough so everyone by the end of the summer, hopefully every staff member could earn their shirt. And we started intentionally trying to help the ones that weren't making it do something extra to get their shirt by the end. Um, and then you celebrate them and year after year now, they just want them to be pink. And so if you see a pink shirt, you know that person earned it. And then if you weren't there for the ceremony, you ask, how'd you get your pink shirt? So. Yep, cool. Yep, that's awesome. All right, Tiff, I'm back to you. Pressure's on. Um, so I'll do a staff one. Uh, every year it, it, in staff training, we do this thing where you lay out this blanket. I don't know the sizes of it, but you, people can Google it. Like you lay out this blanket and all the staff, which I have a small staff, so six people, but again, big, tall sports people stand on this blanket and they have to turn it over to the other side using only their feet. They can't touch it. And so I have the most hilarious pictures of them like holding each other up, standing really close. And the whole point is just to like get really uncomfortable doing something um, and but, but not quitting. So proving that we can make it through and then we relate it back to like what they'll encounter with the kids, et cetera. I'll try to find, um, it, there's specific instructions online. So I'll try to find it so we can throw it in the show notes. But that would be great. Cool. Uh, we, d we do a staff bingo night um, every summer and it's awesome. The kids love, they, they love bingo, the staff. They, they just go for it. You know, again, sort of hokey old school thing, but the staff really, really enjoys it. And we come up with really cool jokey prizes uh, with them also. Um, every camp should have some kind of tradition to get the kids to be quiet, right? You know, so um, at Liberty Lake, we struggle with that at first because we we were tried this, eh, we don't like that, we tried this, eh, don't like that, and we have a Liberty Lake song, and the chorus goes Liberty Lake, it goes like that, and it's a call and response thing. So now that's what people do, and like I, I had a parent. Um, sent me a video uh, it, uh, telling me a story that happened over the holidays where their five-year-old daughter was at Christmas and there was a bunch of relatives there and there were older kids and everybody's yelling and trying to get quiet and the little five-year-old girl just goes Liberty Lake thinking that that would work to get all these cousins to shut up and it, he thought that was kind of cute um, so anyway another one I just want to say is when I was at Frost Valley shout out to Frost Valley the sleepaway camp I went to when I was young um, they at the start of, to get everybody's attention in the uh, dining hall, right? When everybody was eating, try to get quiet before the guy would come out and do announcements. He would pull up a kid and had a joke of the day. And it's just such a simple, easy thing. And 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 that's super. Let me, let me tell you, I tried it in my camp. You got to vet the joke. Very important. <laughs> That the joke, all right? You'd be surprised how a little kid can have a dirty joke, all right? Vet the joke. But um, but if you get that little kid up there with a microphone and think of how many days at camp you have, that could be like 39 days that a kid is gonna tell, a, different kids can tell jokes. Like it's something that they aspire to. It's teaching them to get up in front of a, a group of people. Everybody cheers everybody on. Like he's teaching so many things. And you know, half the jokes are stupid, not that great, but whatever, everybody laughs, it's a good time, right? So joke of the day and, and for, division leaders, unit leaders who are not great at running assemblies, right? Because not everybody, most people are not great at that. That is not a skill that you're born with, right? That is a simple thing to tell them to do, right? To, to sort of get everybody focused and, and everybody started so they can sort of start, you know, uh, what would, you know, could be a boring assembly after that, but it gets everybody's attention first, right? All right, Laura, back to you. All right, I got a staff one. Um, so at the beginning, the, the first thing we do during staff training every day, we have about a seven to 10 day staff training, depending on the year. And uh, we do something called coffee talk. So um, staff kind of trickle into the dining hall, no matter how many times you say be on time. And so what we've done is built in a little bit of a, a structure to catch that and help them get oriented and ready for the day and help them um, form one-on-one -on -one connections with another staff member that they might not have uh, a relationship with already. So coffee talk is a, a different event each morning, um, but could be something as simple as you grab your cup of coffee, you get your buddy um, and you take a lap around the lake. And while you're out, while you're out around, while you're walking around the lake, you find common ground with that person. You find something that um, you, you create a shared moment or a shared memory with them. By the time you get back to the dining hall and are you ready for breakfast, you have one more new friend. Um, we've done 
um, different things like rolled out pieces of paper, giant pieces of butcher paper in the dining hall and you sit across somebody and you finger paint um, with your cup of coffee before breakfast. Um, but I, I, the rules are you have to be, uh, it has to be one-on-one -on -one with somebody that you haven't made a, a connection with yet. And, and uh, you know, you've got your drink of choice. So it's sometimes at camp, um, especially for staff members that are new um, or, or didn't grow up at camp, the staff training experience can be kind of overwhelming. Um, and the one-on-one -on -one time during coffee talk helps kind of ease folks in and create those um, connections so those bigger moments aren't as um, I absolutely love it so so when would you do coffee talk like so here it's they're all showed up like like day one like you know when they one. first get there kind of thing um uh day one is is typically different i would say it's the the first morning you wake up at camp at an overnight camp but i think for day camps um you could do it like the, the if your whole first day is structured one way you could do it the next day yeah or the beginning start. of the second day yeah, yeah like that the day. right nah that's brilliant love it all right Jack. Uh, um so we're only seven years old and we are a, like obviously overly progressive um hippie camp and we had this thing that we called the dream catcher for a while and we got called out on like maybe dream catcher is not the right thing and it looked like a dream catcher right so we've changed it now and we call it the net um, but it works the kind of the same idea as that we've got a big circular wooden thing that has a paracord that loops through it to create a net and laura goes up on the first night of camp and explains that we're a big net that as a community and we're going to catch each other we're going to take care of each other and if you pull on one side it impacts the other side and then we talk about how things are going to happen this week that are going to be awesome and we spray a bunch of paint on it we talk about how you're going to make great friends and you're going to uh whatever all this awesome stuff's going to happen and it, we outline what it's going to be and we throw stuff at the net that leave a impact on the net and then we say and things are going to be hard and there's going to be thunderstorms and you're you're going to cry and maybe there's going to be a mistake and we throw some more stuff at the net so then we hold up the net and the net that was paracord just paracord blue or orange or whatever it is for that week is covered in paint and glitter and glue and whatever it's a visual representation and then um we go on to talk about how the net takes care of each other and you you could get the idea any camp director out there you stand up with a net and explain how it's a metaphor for camp you got it um and then uh, at the end of the week Every kid gets, and I'm holding up on YouTube, a, uh, a piece of paracord. Every kid gets a pair, piece of paracord that they can put on as a bracelet or an anklet, or some kids braid them together for keychains. Um, and they go home with that. And it's a, Laura, go ahead, because you're the one that does this. Well, it's a, it's a piece of the original net that we wove together and that we kind of like watched uh, involve everybody during the week so all of the things that we collectively experienced we separate out and each kid gets to take a piece home with them to remember camp when they leave i'm gonna cry <laughs> and there's tons awesome. of them people have them all up their wrist or some folks pair down i only have one on i i i, I i've got too many too many days at camp but uh you know the, uh people get really upset if they lose them you get the idea it's camp they that's the way that we remember camp so yeah Oh, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, by, by the way, that that is, that is like a Sam Thompson special right there. You should have seen her face <laughs> smiling when you were explaining that. Like, yeah, I was loving that's that. The, I was writing that's notes. The, that's the, yeah, that's the kind of thing <laughs> that she <laughs> usually busts out. So. Yeah. <laughs> You've and, impressed Sam Thompson with an arts and crafty thing. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, day camp, you lose your staff at four o'clock or whatever, they go home. And so trying to do the bonding thing with day camp staff sometimes is a challenge. But, um, over the years, each of my camps have kind of set their own tradition. We have a, a Tuesday night public concert in the park thing and teen camp has staked out their area and their whole staff goes every Tuesday night to the concert and, you know, have their beverage of choice and, and do that. But a lot of the camps will play each other in volleyball or baseball or it's like an open volleyball night. So staff from all four camps just show up on a Tuesday night to play volleyball against each other um, where they don't really get the chance to interact during the day. So it changes every year and it kind of evolves and, um, but just consciously having something where they can actually meet and bond outside of camp or before the camp day or after the camp day, one of the two. Mm -hmm. Awesome. You got one last one, Tiff? Yeah, we do one called outside of the box thinking where people intentionally, well, people, the kids, 
um, pick something that they do not like. Like I do not like basketball. I do not like soccer. I do whatever they do not like and they do it. So they pair themselves up with someone who absolutely loves it. And it's uh, just the exercise in discomfort and proving that they can do hard things and, um, and they try it on and then they can, when they're done, they write about how they feel different about the experience. And oftentimes it is that once the, they just didn't do it well, and that's why they thought they didn't like it. And now that they've tried it, they have a new appreciation for it. Doesn't mean that they're going to like it, but they can at least see it from a different lens. So outside of the box. I love it. I love it. I, I love all these, these great things that, that these traditions that help solidify what you're all about at your camp anyway. Like that's, Laura said it much better than I did, but, but it's great. And, and so I want to end with just, you know, if you can figure out a way at your camp to come up with traditions that also are service projecty kind of things where they're helping uh, help others. Like to me, then you really, you know, that's like the grand slam. So, you know, we have a foundation at our camp and we raise money for it and we're a day camp. So kids can go home and bring money and raise it for the day, camp, you know, for the foundation. So, um, so we do a swimathon, you know, which we got from Project Mori, and now we've sort of adopted it. We do carnation grams where the kids, you know, write little love notes to somebody else and how much, you know, they think about that person and all, and uh, it costs a dollar you know, and it helps raise money. We do bake sales. We do these simple little old school things that, you know, th that honestly, we raise like seven grand every year for our foundation through these little hokey things. Well, kids coming in with 50 cents and a dollar and all those kind of things like that. All right. So anyway, that's what I got. Jack and Laura, you, you're, you, and honestly, Tiff and Sam too, like, it just makes me proud to be your friend and your colleague, you know, to, to hear this kind of stuff. This was, this is a very, um, affirming podcast it really was so I, I thank you guys for coming on and being part of this and um encourage everybody to check out you know tell them where they can reach you guys where they can find there are so many urls and social media links to you guys if you, <laughs> we're going to put it all in our show notes but if you know <laughs> no the big thing is go check out the inspiring radical empathy podcast uh, you won't have to listen to me because Laura and Clee have awesome <laughs> guests and it really is the best. You can find it at Spotify, all the places that you find this. Um, uh, that's the best place, but you can find everything about us really at campstampingground.org. Um, and you can send us emails at jack at campstampingground.org. Right. Or Laura. And, and, and let me channel all of the, uh, all the goodwill of the camp industry, uh, Jack and Laura, when we say that we wish you guys an awesome first kickoff at your new Saratoga in the woods, hippie, radical empathy, social justice, all that lovely stuff, camp, right? Um, it's gonna be great when it happens. And I cannot wait to, to see and hear all about it um, because you guys in your short time as camp professionals, we, we, you're about, about to be at 10 years now, right? That you've like literally like since you went on that trip and all, um, like you guys have met so many people and and talked to so and gathered so much information that these kids going up to your camp are so lucky that they're really getting camp from thousands of people and thousands of years of like you know wisdom and stuff curled up into your little brains and spit out in your cool unique you know 2021 way you know seriously like it, it's really awesome so anyway that means the world that means the world to me thank uh, you well, it, it, I, I, I mean it 100%. So anyway, the Day Camp Podcast is brought to you by, as I said, CRS, Commercial Recreation Specialists, and by our friends at AM Skyer, the leading insurance broker for the finest camps in America for over 100 years. AM Skyer has been a strategic partner with summer camps, ready to support any needs arising in PR, legal, health, facility, and more. Experience the AM Skyer difference for 101 years now. AMSkyer.com. We want to thank Go Camp Pro, um, and our sponsors. And if you like what you hear, subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Check out the show notes. As we said, we're going to put all those stomping ground-ish uh, camping across the country uh, links and all that stuff on daycamppodcast.com, as well as con contact info for the show for Laura, Jack, Sam, Tiff, and myself. Thanks for listening, making yourself a better day camp professional. We'll be back next week with a mini pod and in two weeks with another full episode of the Day Camp Pod.